I want you to all close your eyes and picture the things that I say like a slideshow with each image replacing the last. A cat, a dog, an airplane, a scientist. Hold this final one in your mind's eye for a little bit just to commit your scientist's characteristics to memory. And now open your eyes. Today I want to work through two questions with you all. What a scientist looks like and why does that matter? I'm a theoretical physicist, which just means I'm a, pro I'm a professional thinker. And my job is to try to understand nature. I've been a researcher now for 10 years. And during my talk, I want to demonstrate to you what it means to be a theorist today. And hopefully give some insights into how we all, together, can start asking better questions tomorrow. Being a theoretical physicist is a two-way street. We take data from all the telescopes and we take data from all the telescopes and wonderful experiments pointing at the sky, combine it with data from microscopes like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and then try to encode our understanding in maths, which gives, we hope, previously undetected consequences, namely predictions. Each of these experiments brings teams of physicists and engineers together to develop and innovate technologies pushing the forefront of what we know as fundamental science. This flow and exchange of ideas is the dream of science, whether it's measurement first or theory first. Ultimately, our understanding is broadened and deepened by this constant feedback. And this task, in principle, is open to anyone with access and importantly, isn't changed by whoever takes the measurement. But asking the questions, and which questions, is just as important as whatever answers we may discover. So who are the people that get to ask the questions? Studies from the Anglophone world, asking students from kindergarten through to universities to draw their impression of what a scientist looks like, has revealed that the usual answer is a white man at a chalkboard in a lab coat, or a white man looking through a telescope, or a white man with a microscope. A show of hands if I just mentioned your scientists now. <laughs> Over the decades, science in general has improved its demographics. More women are entering chemistry and biology labs than ever before, and although physics is lagging behind slightly, we're still making progress. And kids are taking notice from less than 1% in the 1960s to over 25 today, kids are imagining and drawing more and more women scientists. Now, unfortunately, still very few of these are black, brown, or indigenous women, but we're still making progress. Now, if I asked you instead what a physicist looks like, I doubt many of you would have drawn a picture that looks anything like me. Although, perhaps if I asked you what a theoretical physicist looks like, Maybe some of you would have drawn some crazy looking guy with mad hair and a huge beard. <laughs> so when it comes to asking questions about nature and our universe, why is it so important to understand who is asking the question? My answer, perspective. My specialism in theoretical physics is trying to understand different phenomena in string theory. One guiding principle for string theorists is the drunken search principle or the lamppost effect. So you're walking home from a party, and as you pass through Platz der Göttinger Sieben, you see a drunk student on the floor searching for something under a lamppost. Uh, what, what have you lost? My keys. And so, like any good Göttinger, you start helping look for the keys. After a few minutes, you ask our poor drunk student if they're sure they've lost their keys here. Ah, no, 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 no. I dropped them in the wall park. So why are we looking for them here? To which our poor drunk student replies, well, this is where the light is. <laughs> and indeed, a lot of time and thought goes into building models that don't only look where the light is. We want to find descriptions of our universe, our keys, wherever they may be in our theory. So if trying to find our keys under the light, perhaps nowhere near where we dropped them, is folly. 
Why do we continue to hire physicists under the lamppost? In other words, do we really think that our definition of merit is sufficiently robust to push all physicists into the light? Or are we missing something? Are we missing some perspectives? Let's make a bet. I'll give you a pat on the back if, when I flip my coin, which... Oh, I didn't bring. When I flip my imaginary coin, uh, I'll give you a pat on the back if it lands on heads. And if it's tails, you can give me a thousand euros. Oh, it's tails. Okay, fine. You know what? I'll give you another chance. In fact, I'll give you 99 more chances. 86 tails and 14 heads. Well, drinks are on me tonight, everyone. <laughs> now, of course, there's no possible way that you would let me get away with this nonsense. The game has completely unfair rules and is obviously rigged. So why then don't we scream the same thing when we see that less than 15% of STEM faculty members are women? Or when we see the number of women postdocs in my field has flatlined at around 10% over 20 years? Or when we look around our working groups, or our faculties, or departments, and wonder the difference between underrepresented and simply unrepresented? Are these also parts of a rigged game? In statistics, Bayes' theorem gives us a way to understand and formulate this problem. Knowing the outcome, we're able to postulate as to how the different possibilities were distributed. Some prior knowledge. For instance, a uniform prior would give us more or less 50 heads and 50 tails. A heavily biased one would not. Now, I'm not here to disparage science or scientists. The science we're doing today is excellent, and the scientists that we have are fantastic. My question is, are we doing the best science that we can be doing? Or aren't we able to imagine the right questions because we inquisitors are only those found under the lamppost? Underrepresented physicists have been dropping off the academic career ladder for as long as they've been allowed to study physics at universities. All of us recognizing that the system is rigged against them is only the first step in us building universal access and building a universal scientific community. If all theorists come from the same socio-economic and socio-political or majority background, then how can we possibly assert that we're asking universal questions? And our science is suffering too. An MIT analysis entitled The Diversity Paradox showed that better questions are being asked by those in the park and their road to the light is full of exclusionary systemic barriers. A diversity of ideas necessitates a diversity of background. Recently, some international colleagues and I began an initiative, an online discussion space we called Stringclusion. We want to help liberate our science and shine a light on all physicists, both under the lamppost and away from it, by demonstrating what scientists will look like tomorrow, providing a platform to our currently marginalized colleagues. We also want to learn from and collaborate with thought leaders and experts, both in our field and the social sciences, to set course for an open, inclusive scientific community. This year we hosted an event at my field's annual conference, and what was abundantly clear was the want for more. More information, more understanding, and more action. We scientists need more conversation spaces for socio-political issues that we have the power to better. And we need more breathing room from our institutions to use this power. Inclusivity, sustainability, and accessibility, these are topics that affect us all in complex, overlapping ways. These are topics that our future colleagues need us to talk and learn more about. String inclusion aims to remove the requirement for future generations to be experts both in their chosen scientific field and experts in the betterment of their socially ascribed identities. We want to help create the freedom for the next generation of scientists to spend more of their time doing, doing and presenting a science that is just in its methods and practices as well as its representation. As scientists we often view injustices in politics or economics as things we simply have no control over. 
And yet we stand idly by as these exclusionary practices poison our labs and our offices. Our silence is complicity, and we must come together and speak up. Young scientists from underrepresented backgrounds, whether they be women, racialized minorities, whether they be women, racialized minorities, persons with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ plus community, or people who experience the non-linear sum of different minority identities, will no longer stand for this status quo. And there's a growing number of our senior allies who are saturated in disappointment, having seen generation after generation drop out. We must stand united and build sustainable change together. A future science for and with all of humankind is one that can be supported by all of humankind. And so I call on all scientists. Let's educate ourselves in the history and legacies of our science and come together to bring about progressive change now. Let's learn from our colleagues in history of science, in philosophy of science, in sociology, in cultural studies, in gender studies, to form actionable plans that will move us toward our goal of universal access to a universal science. Let's pressure our institutions to make good on their inclusive hiring policies and dismantle this pale, male and stale quota system that they've currently got in place. We must demand accountability from our institutions and reject them, putting additional pressure on individual scientists to do more and ever more. Scientists and physicists have a great capacity to learn and adapt. And my call today is that we must do that now. All of this begins with us communicating and collectivizing in understanding that I, as one scientist, might not be able to make a huge impact, but that we, as scientists, together can. It's in all our interests, as scientists and as a society, to ensure that the science we do is really the best science we can be doing. We must reset what best has come to mean under our failed economic template of exploitative measures and destructive competition. A better science is one that doesn't exclude anyone. Without everybody represented, we're failing. And without showing our children science as an inclusive area of study and research, we're just perpetuating that failure. Every day a child wakes up and looks in the mirror, every day that a child wakes up and looks in the mirror and doesn't see a scientist means that we have more barriers to break down. And so I come to you in this city of science and ask, will you join me? Yes! yes. Yeah. Behind me are the pictures and names of physicists who have inspired me during my career so far. The next time you're asked what a physicist looks like, you should draw one of them. Thank you. Woo!